poses John Marino, a drug-running friend of Joe Dogs from Chicago. As for Joe Dogs, he turned out to be a natural at undercover work. Joe was the best that I've ever seen. Uh, Joe had a clear grasp of what the goal was. There was not one request that was made of Joe by the Bureau that he did not comply with and did it credibly. The FBI called it Operation Home Run. With government and mafia money, the undercover operators started up the Beachside Nightclub in Singer Island, Florida. And every step of the way, the mobsters were photographed, videotaped, and recorded. There was times I was scared, yeah. But uh, we were working with, you know, killers. Uh, you know, we were going in the homes of killers. When I say killers, they're butchers. Fat Andy was a butcher. He chopped you up and put you down to the garbage disposal. Joan taught John, and John picked it up and did it so well that Fat Andy Ruggiano, a made capo in the Gambino family, made a hand-to-hand -hand loan with an undercover FBI agent. One of the owners of the bar uh, in Singer Island told me about a year later that they suspected me as being uh, a police officer, an FBI agent, when Joe first brought me in. And the only reason they were telling me that then, or now, was because they knew it was absolutely untrue. Bonino and Joe Dogs wore tape recorders to almost every meeting. Joe wore his where no mafioso would ever feel it by mistake in his underwear. If there's a leak, you never know if they're going to say to you, take your shirt off or take your pants off, you know? So you always got that in the back of your mind that, you know, it's very uncomfortable to work with a wire. If they had found it, that was Joe Iannuzzi's last day. He would, he would have died right there because there would have been, there would have been, that would have been the end of him and the end of uh, the case. And John, too, for that matter. But the case didn't end. It just kept on getting bigger. The concentric circles just became wider and wider and wider. We ended up with people that we had no idea we were going to target in that situation. By the time Joe and John were done, their FBI operations had snared a dozen mobsters. The ripples were felt all the way up the Gambino chain of command. If you go back to all of the things that occurred, especially within the Gambino family and, and what happened with Paul Castellano, Paul Castellano's undoing was as a result of Joe. You can go directly back to that. With information from Joe Dogs, the New York FBI began the pursuit of Big Pauly Castellano that ended in the downfall of the ruling Mafia Commission and ultimately in Castellano's murder at the hands of John Gotti. We really, we put a big crimp in it, or cramp, <laughs> you know, my operation did. Operation Home Run was shut down at last when the FBI learned there was a leak about Joe Dogs to his Mafia pals. Iannuzzi had been wearing a wire for 18 months. He would go on to testify at mob trials for the next decade. He sent Tommy Agro, his one-time idol and would-be executioner, to prison for 10 years. Agro died of cancer in 1987. I wanted him to suffer in prison. I, I really wanted him to suffer. Because I'm suffering now, see? I, because that wasn't my forte, what I did. But I did it to get even. Today, Joe Dogs lives somewhere in America. The FBI says the Gambino family has an open contract out on him. Joe Dogs is a fair target for any mobster who wants to make a good impression on his bosses. I imagine someday someone's going to run across me and pop me. But uh, until then, I'm you know, as careful as I can be. Mob rat Sammy Gravano was big news when he helped put away John Gotti in 1992. But the feds have been using informers to lock up mobsters for more than half a century. One of the earliest stool pigeons helped convict Al Capone in 1930. The rat was Capone's accountant. Capone's uh, liquor business had to have the books kept. Uh, he had a bookkeeper, Louis Shumway. And what the government did with Shumway is they picked him up, took him out of this country, and hit him in there in uh, Latin America uh, until the trial came about, and then he showed up and testified. Capone was found guilty not of murder or racketeering, but tax evasion. 
The punishment for transgression of the Mafia Code of Silence is death. So to obtain witnesses against the mob, the government must first guarantee their safety. This is accomplished by the Witness Protection Program, which offers the turncoat a new identity and protection by U.S. Marshals. With that offer, the federal government has wooed some improbable allies from the world of organized crime. One of those was Cleveland underboss Angelo Leonardo, whose testimony helped end the reign of New York's Mafia Commission. Leonardo is perhaps the single uh, most important organized crime uh, witness that the government has turned. He was in a position to know of the relationship between the Cleveland family and the Teamsters, which was extremely close. He was in a position, because he was an underboss in Cleveland, to know of the national structure of organized crime. Leonardo was also considered one of the mob's most loyal generals. But when he was convicted on a drug charge at the age of 74, Leonardo turned. And he laid out for the feds the nationwide network that ran the American Mafia. He showed how all the lines of power led back to New York. There, the heads of New York's five Mafia families sat on the commission, a Mafia board of directors. It had been set in place in the 1930s by New York mobster Lucky Luciano. And for five decades, it settled territory disputes, divvied up profits, and approved controversial executions. As Cleveland underboss Big Ange Leonardo had taken orders from the commission for years, he fingered Genovese boss Fat Tony Salerno, Colombo boss Carmine the Snake Persico, and Lucchese chief Tony Dux Corallo for supervising the Mafia's activity nationwide. The New York bosses may never have pulled a trigger or spent a dime of illegal cash, but from his high post in the Midwest, Leonardo said he could trace the chains of command to them. When he turned, he proved uh, for all who take the trouble to, to look uh, that the very structure that's designed to insulate the figures of organized crime from accountability can be turned against it. Because he was high up, he had both power and information. When the commission trial was over, the three bosses were convicted and sentenced to 100 years each. Paul Castellano of the Gambinos had been indicted, but he was murdered on John Gotti's orders before the trial began. Angelo Leonardo, thanks to the Witness Protection Program, was freed from prison and relocated. He also admitted to receiving more than a million dollars from the Justice Department. That kind of deal infuriates defense attorney Albert Krieger, who in defending John Gotti, faced mob rat Sammy Gravano on the stand. Krieger says the government has given itself the right to buy testimony. Well, you make the price high enough, and almost anybody is going to say anything in order to either reap a financial benefit, a liberty benefit, uh, or whatever the government happens to be selling at the time. Gotti prosecutor Patrick Cotter worked extensively with Gravano before he testified. He admits that some mob rats are a little too eager to please to show their new government bosses that they're worth the price. A lot of these guys, you get to a point where you have to tell them to look, just let me ask the questions. Don't volunteer things. Don't try to help me. Just tell me what happened. One surprising critic of the deals made with mob rats is a mob rat himself, Joe Dogs Iannuzzi. They get a guy like Sammy the Bull that committed 19 murders and put him in your neighborhood to live and put John Gotti away, which is good to one point. But what did you gain? Sammy DeBose is going to commit more murders. He's going to get more trouble. He's a career criminal. The statistics show that those people who have been professional criminals by going through the witness protection program, it has a better rate of rehabilitation than any other uh, corrections program we know of. In fact, most of these people do not engage in criminal behavior in the future. But the marshals will kick a rat out of the witness protection program for less than committing a crime. And Joe Doggs ought to know. In 1993, he was invited to New York to appear on The Late Show with David Letterman. The Justice Department warned him not to make such a public move. Joe Doggs went anyway. But when he arrived at the studio, Letterman had canceled Iannuzzi's segment. I said that uh, Letterman thinks he's got a problem with that uh, lady sitting waiting for him when he walks in the house. <laughs> Well, he finds, uh, walks home one night and he, he sees me sitting there. 
The marshals dropped him from the witness protection program, but it's thanks to Joe Dogs and his fellow mob rats that the government has obtained convictions against most of the Mafia's leadership in the last 10 years. The existence of the Mafia's bloody brotherhood is now commonly accepted as fact. But until the early 1960s, even the FBI didn't publicly acknowledge that there was a Mafia. That all changed in 1963, when one man broke the decades of murderous silence. The Mafia is a paradox for American justice. On the one hand, it sucks up millions of law enforcement dollars and man hours every year. But it's also an outfit whose very existence is denied by its members. Mob rats have been the key to exposing this clandestine society. Joseph Falacci stunned the world in 1963 when he was the first to uncover America's Cosa Nostra. What I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. Before Falacci testified, uh, there were serious uh, sociologists, uh, people in the media that questioned the very existence of the mob. After Falacci's testimony in public, uh, it became an accepted fact that there was a mob structure. Valachi was a soldier in New York's Genovese crime family. Busted in 1959 on a narcotics charge, he ended up in federal prison in Atlanta, sharing a cell with his boss, Vito Genovese. But soon Valachi became convinced that Genovese thought he was an informer and wanted him dead. One day in the prison yard, Valachi made a preemptive strike. He saw a man approaching him that he was sure was going to be uh, his executioner. And at that point, he grabbed a pipe and uh, beat this guy to death. As he told me, after the first couple of swings, there was so much blood, you couldn't tell who the hell this guy was. It was, in fact, the wrong guy. Valachi had killed a man whom he had mistaken for a known mob assassin. Now he faced a possible death sentence for the prison yard murder. A year after the killing, the aging mob soldier turned to the authorities and offered them his story. Agents interviewed him for more than a year. Then in September 1963 came Valachi's public performance. He appeared before a Senate subcommittee led by Arkansas Democrat John McClellan. There he told the world what he had told the FBI, that there was a mafia, complete with bosses, underbosses, and rituals of initiation which Valachi was the first to describe. He picks your finger. Ooh, ooh, the Godfather. He had to hold a holy picture, burning holy picture, and repeat his oath of allegiance to Cousin Oster and promise never to reveal its secrets, um, even in the face of death. This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. From his remarkable memory, Valachi pulled figures and dates for mob deals, battles, and executions. He mapped out entire family structures in New York and Buffalo. His information had a huge impact on both the underworld and the upper world. A few years after Valachi testified, the federal government legalized its triple threat against the mob. Wiretapping statutes to allow eavesdropping, the witness protection program to recruit informers, and the RICO anti-racketeering law. Naturally, the mob wanted Valachi dead, but they never got him. And although the federal government first suppressed a book based on the FBI's interviews, Peter Moss eventually published the Valachi papers from his own talks with the informer. Valachi died in prison in 1971. The one thing that made him happy was the fact that Vito Genovese died in prison too and died before him. The last message I got from Valachi that I can recall was, you see, Peter, I told you this book would kill the old man. Valachi and those who followed him have forever taken away the invisibility of the Mafia. Their reasons may have been self-serving, but by exposing the mob's inner workings, the mob rats have made a unique contribution to American justice, and they have helped cripple the mob, perhaps permanently. The ethnic core of the Mafia, Italian-Americans only and others need not apply, reinforced the membership's pride and loyalty. In the wake of successful mob prosecutions, gangs built around other immigrant groups are moving onto the scene. These outfits, Asian, Hispanic, Jamaican, and others, have adopted the brutal methods of the Italian mob, but they have not shown the obsessive loyalty that kept the old mafia intact for so long. 
Leaders of some new gangs are already behind bars, put there with the help of turncoats from their own ranks. In fact, with its...